This place is called Austin Speed Shop. It's just a custom car shop, you know? We specialize in like old style craftsmanship and, and stuff that's timeless. Today I've never felt better about myself and where I am in life because I've eliminated everything that's not working on cars or motorcycles. And that's truly what makes me happy. Back in the early 90s when I was working for Performance Machine, you know, motorcycle building and custom bike building wasn't really a profession. Once I came up with a product, which was the Fenders, and started making them, then it made, when money started coming in, then it all of a sudden made sense to everyone and helped my business grow. So we're gonna make some fenders. It's kind of cool because my whole business like really took off when I started making fenders and I refined this whole process of metal spinning them in halves and then welding them together. And like, you know, I made the first big fenders for like fat tire Harleys back in the early 90s. You know, we did that process forever for better part of 20 years. And then now we've kind of, you know, now, but making, I don't even need to do it like that. I can make them, you know, as I've learned more and more metal work, I can make them just by flat sheet, you know. And so I figure we should do one with like, out of aluminum for my little knucklehead. You know, pretty simple stuff to do, but you know, this is something that people can learn, you know, as they get more tools and better stuff in their garage, they can learn how to do it, so. In the last year at the speed shop, it's like kind of, I've kind of like managed from afar and just given blips of advice here and there, but now I've stepped in and kind of uh, taken an active role in managing the place and giving it structure and basically helping push those guys and let them, you know, they don't know how hard they could be working, trying to get projects out the door and just, I don't know, I can only sit back and watch so long and like, I just want to push them and, and keep getting cool stuff out there. So I'm good at making crews work. Uh, working with Jesse has been really cool. Um, been picking up a lot of small things and big things. I mean, the more things you can do with one tool, like opening up more, more options when put building something, instead of like doing it one way that I've always done it, now there's like a few more. So getting, a job done faster, it's gonna be easier, or like figuring out how to make a part in one piece instead of like two maybe, stuff like that. Oh yeah, he's a good teacher. Guys like him almost don't even have to teach. Just being able to sit next to him, you pretty much get to see his process and how Jesse like goes about doing things and like almost what you focus on the most and what your like end product is and like the ways to get there and like just your little techniques that you picked up over the years and years and years. I busted that out of like an hour and a half the other night. Why is it all rusted? This is a rusty piece of metal in the yard. Why didn't you clean it before you did it? I did. It's been like three days though, four days, I started rusting again. Just wanted to practice making an edge over though on English wheel. Looks good. Bit. When you build a boat, it'll be good for the like, boat trailer. All right, that's what I figured. Where's your practice piece at? <laughs> to try to impress the teacher. <laughs> you gonna do like a wire edge? Uh, yeah, we could do wire edge on one. Could we? I really want it. <laughs> okay. I just haven't. I I'll show you how, how to do it. it. Take that wiring off. It's <laughs> not welding. You might have to like. No, oh, that's not touching. It looks like it's like wasn't machined or something. There you go. Thank you. It's like a front fender off of something. That's why it has the double lip on it. Yeah. Triumph or something. British crap on an American bike.
Ooh. Does that have mill marks on it? Should be all right. We can anneal it. Um, we don't have a radius gauge, do we? Yeah, that's why I was wondering if you had one. Yeah, cloth tape. A cloth tape measure. Oh, I have one. Okay. So we'll best we'll measure this thing first. Pull it out of your utility belt. Yeah. This tire's pretty square, yeah. which I don't want even want to entertain making it square because I'll probably change it to a nicer radial tire. I just want to get like how much coverage we need. So right there is about 10 inches of material, you know, giving it about an inch coverage. And you know, for car tires and bike tires, this is kind of almost a car profile bike tire, but the average is they grow 5% in overall while it's driving? Yeah, so that's the rule of thumb. So if this thing, you know, just equal, if it's 28 inches tall, then 5% of that is how much it's going to grow. I usually set it a minimum three quarters, yeah. you know, but the cars you can set a little bit tighter, but if the tire pressure gets low, that thing's going to oblong, you know, like a top fuel tire and it'll burn the paint or kill the fender. Um, bikes, you also got to consider too that to get it on, get the chain on, you have to be able to slide it forward, you know, and then then have a certain amount of adjustment. So you probably need a little bit more clearance in front than you do at the visible gap. You know, I always cheat. You know, I'll, I'll fit it super tight here so it looks like it's a close fit and leave the sides long and then I'll adjust it and then I'll take a scent, I'll take a scribe off the axle and I'll cut the sides out so it looks like it's fit perfect and tight, but it has extra gap in the front. So the fender will be one radius, and then the actual side cutout will be offset. Yeah. And I, che I cheat yeah. like that so it looks like it's super, super tight, and it's got, you know, when you're standing at the back of the bike, it's like right on the tire, and you're like, man, that looks good. But really, it's got plenty of room around there, so you can adjust it, or if the axle loosens up it, and it cocks the wheel or something, it doesn't kill it. So, you know, that's the factors you got to think in, you know. So we'll go a little extra length. So 28 inches and then probably go 29. So we have extra wing for that half inch flap. So what are we, 11 by 29? So do you want to cut a piece 11 inches by 29 inches? and then we'll anneal it up and we'll start start shaping. I'll show you guys how to figure in the radius. So 11 by 20, 29. You wanna go with this flat edge, you wanna? Yeah, yeah, use the, use the two available edges, you know. Uh, basically, just 29 by 11 inches. When you use this uh, straight edge over here, it basically gets it square on the corner of the piece. So all I have to do, instead of like marking it a couple times and then putting a straight edge on it and pulling it across, I can just use this angle right here and I know it's straight. Why are you doing it upside down? So I can see it better. Oh, okay. He's cutting it pretty straight though, I'll give him that. That's because it's upside down. <laughs> the roll finally caught up with it. We're gonna cut them corners off anyway. When you anneal aluminum, you gotta stick it in water after? You can.
So we put that soot on there. You know the trick, the soot burns off right at the temperature point when this becomes soft. So, but you gotta be careful though because it's only about another 100 degrees before it melts. I haven't really got the opportunity to work a lot of aluminum. So it's really nice to see how it like, how it moves and stretches. I've worked copper before and it's kinda almost close because you can anneal it. It'll start to turn like a little yellow once it, it gets ready to melt. And the annealing, basically what you do is you heat it up like we were doing and the, all the molecules in the metal will pull apart. And it's like uh, all those metals, a lot of the non-ferrous metals, they separate really easy. Their bonds aren't as strong, like on a chemical level. So when you heat it up, it spreads it out and then you cool it with water. And since you're cooling it with water, it freezes the molecules pulled apart. So you can basically like move the metal with your hands almost. That's official hot. So is there a difference between air cooling it and water? Um, when you anneal it doesn't, it'll freeze it in a cool position so you can anneal it, you can quench it, it doesn't, doesn't affect it at all. So aluminum is way different than steel in that fact, so it's really cool to be able to work it and learn it from a guy who's done it a bunch of times before. That's good, thanks, Magic. So we can put that on there and see, you know, obviously no problem with the, the yeah. long way radius. You know, it's just pulling the sides down. But we don't want to start with it like this because when we, then when we shrink the sides, the sides will pull it in even more and then our radius will be too tight. You know, and then we'll have to open it up, which in turn will like open this up, you know, which is a lot to understand, but you'll see. So, you know, really want to start. We can give it a little bit of head start, but we really want to start with it almost flat. Pull these sides so we get this compound curve. So this whole thing, you know, bends like this, curves this way and then curves this way so it fits on the tire. I'm pushing this down a little bit to get it going in the right direction, you know? So you can see that's pulling that down a little bit. But what'll happen is we're only affecting this area right here, probably the first two inches. So and that's gonna leave this, you know, kind of flat. It'll have a little bit of crown just from the metal being affected, but it's not gonna have like a big radius like we want. So we gotta go in farther. So we'll start taking some bites. Um, we're using that little Eckold forming tool, you know, and it's it works pretty good. It, you know, and like, I mean, it's an awesome machine. I mean, if that's all you have, you're doing pretty good. You know, because it kicks ass over any other like shrinker that I've ever had. The Eckold shrinker, it has two dies that pinch in and they press together and they grab the metal and then they move towards each other. So it goes down and bam. So it just grabs the metal and drags it in, making shrinking it, making it thicker and making that outer dimension smaller and that gets it to curl over. Once we get it kind of radius, so I'm pushing each one, I'm pushing down. You see the little bump, so I go down. And then all I wanna do is get it to about 90. Once we get it to 90, you kinda of wanna stop, cause that's when it's gonna start curling. It's getting there. There. Feel how hard it is. Yeah, let me try it so shrinking it back is almost like not work harding it, but it well, kind of is. Well, that thing grabs it with those teeth and then drags it together. 
So, you know, it, it, you know, it's it's kind of it's like the opposite. It's forcing of it, you know. Yeah. A hammer's compressing it into shape, and this is like dragging it. You know, both ways work, but this will get work hardened where it just won't move anymore, which is kind of good because it's slower. A hammer will just. As soon as it gets work hardened, you know, just split the metal. You don't need to do the center because it's only really work hardened where we, right, where we're. Yeah, and pretty much when you anneal it, it basically stays annealed until you work harden it to a certain yeah. point, right? There you go. You can quench it if you want. Use those little flat pliers. You can that soften that a little bit. It's still kind of hard. Yeah, it's still kind of hard. Yeah, that's a lot closer. Yeah, and once we wheel this and pop it up, then yeah. it'll kind of suck that in even more. The English wheel is, it's just two dies, a radius bottom die, and they have a little contact point, and it's just basically pressing, you know, a line. And you could like overlap the lines, and the line just follows the radius, and then that bottom die will dictate what your part radius will end up being. When you're using this thing, you try to pull, like you try to Keep it with the shape of the roller, right? Yeah, you go straight in, straight out. Because if you pull so it up. So if the mo middle's arced, you arc it. Right. You know, the best thing to do is get low so you can see it. Mm -hmm. You know, that way, because going this way, you know, unless you're like rolling an edge or something, which you rarely do, you don't ever want to kink it or push on it or you don't yeah. want to help it like you do with the shrinker. So you're just going to it up. What we might do is cut it. Weld it together. Pull it in. Because we got nice sides. That's a nice shape for that kind of tire and stuff. So, and the wheel, you know, I'm pretty, I, that's what I started off on. I was the English wheel guy for 10 years, for a decade before I switched to Power Hammer. And so I'm really, really proficient at it and can like really wheel pretty great. But man, that's a lot of work. <laughs> and I was like, sweat my <laughs> off. The whole trick to this is just steering it, man. It takes, Takes a while to learn how to steer an English wheel, you know? And the best thing to do at first is just go super slow. You know, I'm just going in a zigzag pattern. Right Looks pretty symmetrical too. I mean, these are kind of messed up, but once we wire the edge, It'll then pull it's it in. no, it doesn't pull it in. It just makes it so it stays. You can put it right where you want it, and bam, you know. Um, that's good. If you guys want to, let's measure it and see where we're at. So we're at ten. Cut three and a half out of the center. You'll lose a quarter inch when you cut it, so cut it down the center, and then cut an inch and a half on each side, and that'll give us with six and a half. And then while we have it apart, then we'll we'll put it in the planisher and kiss these sides a little bit, and just take a little bit of the harshness out of it. And then uh, I'll show you how to do a rib. We'll do a rib down the center, maybe some kind of little design or something. Cool. Sounds fun. It's a good way of marking the center on this. Just eyeball it, dude. Don't even, don't even try to like, <laughs> don't break out rulers or anything like that. Just whatever feels good.
Luke, you know, he's so quiet and so like subtle demeanor, you know, but he's like really, really good fabricator and really, really open to like input and suggestions and he wants it, you know, he wants to do the best job possible and like, you know, he's gonna be one of the best, I feel, one day. I love Magic, man. He's like such a like bright, shining, like he just like wants to learn everything and the fact that he made that little flat fender piece on his own to practice, you know, it's like he's thinking and he's reading and he's looking at everything and like Magic's getting there, he's really good, he's, he's getting broad, you know, and he's not just fabrication, you know, he's like motors and trans and doing blacksmith work and he just kind of wants to try it all. I think I need to spend way more time with him and, you know, try to teach him and, and give him everything I have, you know. Almost looks right on already. You can tell I've done that before, how I nailed the gap and radius, like per, just by eyeballing it, by how much, what affects that is by how much I step it and pull it down as I step it. Cause I'm like basically making it an octagon shape. Cause I go deep and bink and then pull it out of half a stroke and then more, half a stroke, more, half a stroke, more. So that octagon shape is what determines this radius. We'll come in tomorrow and we'll bead that. Or maybe we'll do it out at the house where it's cooler. Okay. We'll beat it and then uh, do the wire edge and then should be good to go. Um, I was driving my 71 440 Cuda. Now that I'm here in Texas with all these country roads, man, it's better to have a big block Mopar with the five speed. Wow. People want to apprentice. Well, I get like written letters, emails, Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, every possible way that people can get to me and want to like come and have me teach them stuff. You know, the, the only way to see the real value in my skills is to give them away. I get to work and like, realize what I know how to do and show people. I want to see this trade thrive and go back to the 40s where, you know, craftsmanship and pride and hand making something had a value. You know, and I think it's all about this. It's your hands and using your hands and giving yourself a sense of self pride. It feels good to do it as fast as I do it, you know, and like, it gives me an opportunity to like realize I guess how, how skilled I am and how lucky I am to have the skills I have. And you know, it's, I'm not the greatest metal worker in the world because I'm still learning and I'll, I'll keep learning and keep trying new things till the day I die. And so hopefully I can keep passing that on. Cool, so we got these pieces ready to go. We can go turn this edge. We'll put the, put that bead down the center. Maybe get something fancy. And then uh, put a wired edge. And then we'll uh, weld it back together. We should be cool. Just pretend like that's the fender. If you invest in good quality tools, they will last forever if you take care of them and maintain them right. Like my beading tools and stuff like that I've had since I worked at Boyd's. Start with this thing, as close as you can get it so where it'll still fold, so about the thickness of the piece of material. Put it in there, get it to touch, and count. Because we're doing two pieces, so you want the both to be the same step. So one, two, so that's one revolution, and I'm holding it up. You'd rather do it on a test piece than take your nice, pretty part you just spent a lot of time on and go, oops. <laughs> I always keep this thing loose so I can always get my body like kind of comfortable position. You can always go in a direction where you can, you can see the line and you can see where the dies are hitting it. So to have, so that's not much of a, a radius, you know, that's like kind of just a Yeah. 
So how I get a bigger radius, let a little bit of slack out, you know, let this. So just remember your inch and a half on the first one or one and a half turns on the first one, but only go one on your first pass. Yeah. Then go another half turn and clean it up. And then one turn on the second step. You don't want to, because that's digging into the metal, so you only want to do one shot. You don't want to make a bunch of passes. Yeah. Make as minimal passes as you can so it doesn't dig a hole that you have to file out. But the cool thing about this, if you, if you get a wobble in it or something, just stick it in the planishing hammer and hammer it back flat and then start over, you know, instead of trying to like dig deeper or push it or whatever. Okay, you wanna go to the next one? Let me see real quick, Luke, we might wanna go a full turn, cause it's not. Eagle. Looks good. The most important thing is to remember your turns, cause like when, if you forget and you'll have one, it's like the wrong step or, you know, does it get stronger? Does it feel? What's that? Yeah. Little, little strength action to it. It's getting there. It sucked it in a little bit cause that took a little bit of material. But well, when we come push it down, then it'll, should go right to the right spot. On that edge. We'll just tune that up by hand. You normally just try not to worry about it though. Yeah, it'll, it'll come around. That looks good. Just wondering, but you think you could do that on a piece that's connected? Like if this was just one fender? Just like oh, well, we wouldn't be able to get it in the machine because it wouldn't, it oh, wouldn't yeah, feed no. through here. So that's why it's good to cut it. It's cutting in half gives you good, like opportunity to like detail stuff, you know. I did that mostly just to clean it. So to clean that edge before we weld it. You know where you get the stuff to like hold chemicals, right? Beauty supply store. Yeah. Because women put all kinds of crazy in their hair. That's the only thing that'll hold up to like acetone and lacquer thinner. Yeah, just make sure you're clean and make sure you take that when they kiln this stuff, you know, when they, it has like a, a finish on it that doesn't weld, like to weld through. So you gotta make sure you take like coarse scotch bright and go through that, get that finish off of it. Is there a reason why you take welding as opposed to other kind of welding? Uh, well, it's, it's pretty much the standard deal. You know, we could gas weld it, but something like this that isn't super hypercritical of leaking and we don't have to do any shaping. You know, gas welding's good if you have to do some shaping after the fact and it has to stay malleable. This can be stiff and strong as we want it and it doesn't really matter. I didn't see it back together. Yeah, it almost looks like a fender. Yeah, bead doesn't look too bad. No. It's 
You always sand those tacks down. You know, never weld over the tacks unless it's like a super flat one, because then it'll like camel hump, you know, because metal will add more metal where there already is some. And you know, it's like the one good thing about that bead too is it holds the thing in place. You know, it doesn't, it won't warp it up. It'll stretch it and move a little bit, but it pretty much locks that weld right there. So you could just sand it, you know, kiss it to, to finish it. Kind of good to shape it right now too after you weld it because it's still hot. Yeah, and it's really easy to move around. <laughs> well, it's good. It fits the wheel perfect. So, so all we got to do is finish that center piece, and then fold, you know, roll the edge, and then mount it. Took a little drive out to Marble Falls, right by my house. They had Lake Fest, they had drag boat races. I'm into anything with a giant motor and a little tiny vehicle. <laughs> when I first started building bikes, I had a friend of mine, Kenny, that raced. He had a top fuel boat. I was kind of around it quite a bit, and his friends and the other racers. And I think that's I pulled a lot of my style for building bikes out of drag boats because it's like that. You know, it's a big, fast race vehicle, but it's super detailed and nice, and it's kind of showy, you know, and I kind of like that. It's cool to make something fast like the space shuttle, and it's all military grade and, you know, purpose built, but it's kind of neat to do something fast and it's functional, but also with a little bit of flair, you know, make it, make it, you know, sweet looking, <laughs> you know? And I've kind of been thinking like over the last year or so is building a cool little lake boat. You know, I have a pretty bitchin' little like, you know, 640 Donovan blown big block that would be perfect on a little boat. I don't know if I want to race it, but it'd be cool to just have it to blip around the lake on. Until someone came up next to me, then it's on. I took my son, Jesse James Jr. He likes to do this type of stuff and trip out on weirdo people. And like, <laughs> it's just fun to do stuff with him. Bonding top fuel time. That's the first time I've kind of like, since I moved to Texas, it's the first time I've went to anything that's kind of like my people, you know, like in, I don't know, everybody was really nice. And, you know, I think I've like kind of backed away into my own little corner here in my shop and not really been out and about too much. I saw everything I wanted to see. It was cool, hanging out in the pits. I like the pits better than the racing almost. I just like to see all that stuff being worked on and you know, just, I don't know. I like being around that stuff. <laughs> I feel it really at home and like, like that's where I belong, you know? And everybody like kind of made me feel really welcome, you know? It's like drag boats and tractor pullers. They like polished up anodized man. You know, like top fuel cars and drag cars, it's all like purpose built. They'll put a nice paint job on it, but 
pretty much everything's utility, you know, it's like military finishes and dura coated and everything's built to like last and not really look good. Drag boat guys, man, they're kind of like pimps. They like pop, Keith Black, big block, you know, Hemi motor all polished and anodized fittings to match. And it's just like my type of stuff. Yeah, like as soon as I hear like a big motor with straight pipes, like I instantly like get goosebumps. Like it's like some kind of drug for me. We got this welded and kind of like squished into shape. So now we just got to metal finish it and make it pretty, you know, and then do all of our details like a doubled edge and put a reinforcement on the back. We'll probably rivet something and then uh, show kind of half how to mount it, you know, and how to space it out. Yeah. The only problem I see is is it's this is dipping down a little bit. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I couldn't tell or not. So we just have to like try to address that a little bit. This thing's like what it's like leaning this way a little bit. And that could just be from the angle it was fed through the machine. I'm not overly concerned with it, but you know, I think well, it's so slight that once it's on the bike and once the edge is, once we put the edge on it and even it up and this is all smooth and I don't think you'll really notice it, but I noticed that, that they were holding, one's holding it a little higher than the other. And so just that little bit will affect it, but it, uh, you know, and there's no way to correct that unless you have like some kind of like gauge to make sure they both hold it at the exact same you know, way. God, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I was seeing how close it comes to the chain if we need to jog that in a little bit. I think we do. The only problem with this, the only thing that I, that bums me out about that whole type of shrinker method is just the surface yeah. kills it, you know? Because there's no really way to get that stuff out of there. You could plane this shit, but it's still gonna leave grooves. Yeah. And there's no real way to get that out of there except for sanding it, you know, which removing material, which is, it's okay. Yeah, that, except for that very edge, that stuff knocks that right out. Except for that extreme, you know, edge, but we're gonna roll most of that away. You guys just wanna remember too, you know, the only way to get something smooth is to use flat, use flat surfaces, you know that, right? Like start off with a file. You know, that'll, a file will find all your high and low spots. That's pretty straight, other than the surface disruption where it uh, sanded it, you know, where it grabbed it and pulled it in on itself. Pretty straight. You can fill that stuff a little bit. We could file it and get it all out, but I think for that bike, that's presentable, you know? And the more we file it, the thinner the material gets. You know, I actually kind of like seeing that. 
tiger stripes. Yeah, because then it like then you could tell how oh that I could look right at it and know how someone made it. Just like that, you know, where you only see the, you know, where you have a consistent amount of you know sand scratches, and you're not seeing any of the low spots. You know, I'd stay away from that. You know, you can kiss that lower edge just to dress it, but that's gonna get folded anyway. And sometimes that's what metal works about is like showing some restraint. I mean, you could push so hard and do so much and keep doing these steps and stuff, but sometimes it's like, you gotta realize when it, enough's enough, you know, when it's done. Use the table so it's you're digging into the metal and not because that thing, if this thing's moving, this thing isn't doing yeah, This exactly. needs to be locked down so that's like working it. A lot of what inspired me is videos like this. It was like Monster Garage and all those. I was like, uh, I just watched so many of those shows and so many videos as much as possible. I would just go out and like put my own spin on it and try to like learn as much as I could, like actually like doing it instead of watching the things. You just get the ideas from watching them, learn uh, other people's processes, but it's just something inside you that really like makes you really want to do it. Do you want me to show you how to get those low spots out? All well, dark spots where the sander doesn't hit are basically all low spots. It's kind of like if you bondo a car, they use different color primer and different color bondo. So when you sand through, the different colors show you where all the low spots are at. So this, you just see a darker piece of the metal, basically. When I lived in California, that was kind of almost one of my dreams. It was like, oh, what if I could get good enough to work at West Coast Choppers or like learn something from him, you know? So it's actually like these videos actually mean a lot to me. It's kind of like, it's pretty much a dream come true. It's like the things I used to watch that like, basically inspired me and like now I'm doing and it's still inspiring me like even more and hopefully it helps other people go through the same thing. This is a bullseye pick. So if you have a low spot on metal, this will you'll put it in this little half circle in the center and you just pull on it from the bottom side. It'll hit right underneath where your bullseye is. You know, get in there and really dress the metal, you know, put some muscle behind it. Good, it looks good. So it's, doesn't it like, once you put a finish on something, doesn't it changes your whole perspective on it, you know? So that's where we're gonna end up. We'll scribe the inside of it, but you guys can see. So that's where we're gonna end up. So what we have to do is, we're just gonna go straight along the edge so what we have to do is turn this edge in so it kind of, so we end up right where we want to be. And this, this is going to disappear. So this is all that you're going to see. Uh -huh. So your rolled edge should complete that radius to that. to roll it. So we'll scribe the inside of this uh, half inch. Let's do this side first. The smoother you can make this line, the smoother that lower edge will be. And then it look cool just like that, <laughs> that little and it adds like strength, but. Getting there. How much better that looks. Yeah, it looks good. Taking that edge away, you know? This is just 10 gauge galvanized fence wire for like chain link fence, for stringing chain link fence. 
Okay. Same discipline. Just go a little bit at a time. Sound like hitting it over and then hitting it down. Like getting in there as far as I can, the best angle and, and hitting it down so it like curls onto the wire. And I'm just clamping it far enough away so I don't see any gap. I mean, people got all kinds of like gizmos and things to like do this, but this is just the way that works yeah. without messing stuff up. You know, it's labor intensive, but you know. It's on now, yeah. you feel it? Pretty cool. It's the one everybody wants. It's pretty awesome. So we can mount that all the way. Pretty much just making a support where you mount the fender to and double it up. So you basically put another piece of metal under it and rivet it on there. Luke made this little reinforcement strap and we just riveted like a mechanical joint so we didn't warp any of our metalwork and and then uh, you know riveted it on so it's super strong. Magic's making another little bra a strap that'll double here. It's the only tried and true method I've found for gapping a fender. Some people use like foam rubber or like a fuel line, you know, drape it around the tire. I've been using this method since I was in my garage. It just works. Four shop rags folded in fours is the exact shim for a rigid fender. Well, we just finished finishing the fender and then we put a wired edge on it, which makes it really strong. And since it's thin aluminum, you know, as much like kind of structural strength you can give it without material strength, then, you know, it'll help it last a long time, especially on something like a rigid frame Harley, which is kind of, you know, vibrates all over the place. So it's kind of nice to do something that, that's gonna be more solid. You need to make a sissy bar with a grab handle. Um, I just took some some half inch square stock and then drew it out and made it probably like go from like three eighths down to like quarter inch. We're gonna weld it together. Forge weld it. I think it's awesome. It's kind of, it's where everything started. So it's pretty much, you know, if you think like all the way back, I don't, I don't know, I'm not a historian, but it's gotta be at least like a thousand, two thousand, maybe three thousand years, people have been blacksmithing and coppersmithing, making weapons and whatever they needed. So it's kind of, it's the origination of like all metal work. So basically everything we do now, welding, everything is derived from that in some way. Every time you watch someone do anything, especially blacksmithing, you kind of just watch what they're doing and pick up little techniques on it. I've seen it done before and I know how to do it, but I haven't seen anyone in person kind of do the dimples where you put the rivets in. Because once you heat the metal, it's real hard to keep it centered because it wants to slide off and you can split the metal. So it's kind of cool to watch somebody actually do it. So you don't, uh, that was a good technique. I always wanted to do a sissy bar with a grab handle and I kind of like, I don't know, it's a good way to mount it. I think it's a good mix, like something that's like kind of ultra light race car aluminum riveted heli arced and then something that's like hot riveted you know forged iron into shape
I went to Israel almost two years ago and apprenticed with a man named Yuri Hoffi, and he's like probably one of the best in the world, so I can hear him yelling at me the whole time I was making that. I love that look with those rivets and those holes like that. Looks cool, huh? You guys feel like you learned some stuff? Wire and edge, riveting, gapping, using the shrinker. Got a pretty good range of skills in a couple <laughs> days, yeah. There's a lot of small things that I can apply to a lot of things I do every day, using the shrinker and Working against it, that was a cool one. Um, doing the wire edge is a good one. Just kind of a little, little bit of everything, like a little bit of each process is, uh, is always good to do with someone else. And you know, like how fast he welded the fender, that's good to know, you know, like, especially if you have like the tools and experience to straighten it out afterwards, you can go pretty fast, you know. Good job, guys. Appreciate it, man. You did a great job. I think to realize that something that's this complicated where guys with the vintage bike, like, you know, old school Harley chopper, you know, they'll search all over everywhere trying to buy the perfect fender and spend $400 for some welded up piece of that came off some Triumph on eBay that's like old school, you know, and like, They'll have to put so much work in it to make it half cool when you could just make one that's 10 times better from scratch. I just love that, it makes it look like it's like a million years old, you know? I'm gonna cheat, I'm gonna put it back in the furnace and boil it so you can't see where I welded it, so it looks like one piece. <laughs> Yeah, that just heated it up and squished them together. So like when the rivets go in and we squish it with all the rivets, then it holds it together tight and it kind of keeps it uniform. And so it's kind of cool to like, you know, help guys, you know, instead of just building the same that everybody else is, take it a step further and make it your own, you know, make your own cheap metal. And, you know, don't just buy a triumph, a ribbed fender and a wassail tank, you know, go and make your own stuff. And then it's your own bike, you know, 
it's kind of what I started doing 20 years ago is just like I got tired of all the in the industry that there was available so I just started making my own stuff you know and I'm still I still won't buy anything I still want to make everything myself little Yuri Hoffy secret lacquer dye mix best thing to do man those drill bits like they once they catch rubber there's nothing stopping them so what I always do is like take a piece of metal and bend it and just put it underneath there if you're gonna drill a hole in a fender before without taking it off or taking the tire off because it never fails if you don't do that it'll catch and drill right through your new tire That thing's strong, man. Don't take away just fenders and just making a fender. Okay, well, if I need a fender, now I can make it. No, I think that kind of curve and making those, those complex you know, curves both ways, you know, that works for a lot of stuff and works for a lot of different applications. So I hope they can like visualize that technique and that process into other parts. Like Luke is working on that 37 De Zephyr Dan's right now and he needs to make inner fender wells. And like, I didn't say anything to him yet, but I hope he realizes that he can use that technique to make a one-sided fender to make those inner fender wells, no problem. If you like to do metal work and make stuff and you can find a connection with this, then do it. Nothing's gonna make you happier than to make something for yourself and be creative and, and be able to create something for yourself. You know, that's the ultimate feeling of like, pride and freedom is to like make yourself something and your hands made it. You didn't make money and buy it, no, you actually made it. Mm -hmm.